you here to the 28th Annual Small Business and Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Today's program is sponsored by Bank of America. Bank of America was established in 1904 in the state of California. Today it is the second largest bank in America with more than two trillion of capital T there, dollars in assets in 2,500 locations located throughout 37 states in the United States. The Bank of America serves 3 million small businesses nationwide and employs more than 200,000 people. Uh, we are happy to have a number of their employees here today, including Paul and Eddie and his entire team right to my left. Uh, please, please stand and uh, enjoy a round of applause and I appreciate it. <laughs> it's nice to see my former colleague and, uh, and our former uh, Vice President of the National South Chamber of Commerce, Kerry Warren, who's uh, here with us. She just joined the team after leaving a, what, 12 or 13 year career as a chamber exec. So congratulations to both of you, Paul, and uh, the team. You will notice uh, in the center of each table is a bottle of wine uh, from Monica Jenkins of MBJ Wines, a local small business located in Easton and a book by philanthropist and book author, Bill Cummings. Anybody here of Bill Cummings? Anybody? Bill Cummings? I've got a couple more staff. Okay. So if you could all take a look under your plate now, the person with the Chamber logo sticker is going to be the winner of the wine and the book. You may not want to do both of those at the same time. Small businesses bring to this country. 
Today's Small Business Week has evolved into Small Business Month, which provides us more opportunity to honor those individuals whose impact extends far beyond their reach, touching the lives of their peers, their families, their successors, and inspiring the minds of body entrepreneurs everywhere. Today's recipients will join a long list of triumphant business people and entrepreneurs who use their ingenuity to adapt to changing economic and social climates, not only to survive, but in this climate, to thrive. When I think about our small businesses in this region, I'm amazed at all we have to offer our residents, visitors, and investors. On each of your tables, and hot off the press, is our newest chamber, Book for Business. This book contains information on all member businesses, but also some interesting demographics about this region as well. We've already sent out more than 10,000 copies of the book for business already. Please pick up one on your table or on the way out as you go uh, to lunch. We also have with us today some elected officials who not only recognize the importance of small business within our community, but support small business as well. It's our honor to have Mayor Bill Carpenter of the City of Brockton with us. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being with us. <laughs> we have State Senator Mike Brady here. <laughs> I don't know if she's here at the moment, but Representative State Representative Claire Cronin and Representative Jerry Cassidy will be joining us as well. City Councilor Ann Beauregard and Mark Lindy from Southeast Regional School. My pleasure now to introduce Denise Lebeka from the Fuller Craft Museum, and she's the director. Uh, Denise, is, Denise serves as the director of Fuller Craft, bringing more than 30 years of museum and nonprofit experience to the museum, having held positions at Plymouth Plantation, Huntington Theater Company, Mass Audubon Society, Trailside Museum and as a textile artisan with Plymouth Craft. She's taught and lectured both nationally and internationally on the history and techniques of the textile arts. In addition to a BA in studio art, Denise is a practicing watercolor artist and textile artisan as well, and brings both the working knowledge of the craft as well as museum management to her important role. Please join me in welcoming Denise, our host, who I will introduce. She's going to sit at that big table right there. Thank you. Museum here and, and has for many years, but 
As a member of the community, can you talk about some of the community programs that you have? I sure can. Um, it really started back in 2017 when we wrote a new strategic plan. And one of the four main initiatives of, of our strategic plan is actually community engagement. And that came about from going back to the original deed of trust from Myron Fuller in 1947. And what he says is he built this museum uh, to be a resource for the community. And so we took a good hard look at how we were fulfilling that mission, uh, wrote it into our strategic plan, and then that July opened a for free to Brockton residents. So everyone who lives in Brockton can come to this museum free of charge as many times as they would like to, which is really <laughs>
my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, our panelists and our moderator from the U.S. Chamber. And as you might know, the Metro South Chamber is truly honored to be accredited with five stars by the U.S. Chamber. And that's five stars, by the way, out of five. Today we have with us Dr. Anton Bazell from the U.S. Chamber of Foundation to help us address a really important topic. Anton has 20 years of combined clinical research, health services, policy and management experiences with various private and public organizations and agencies within health and human services, including Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and National Institutes of Health. Most of his career has been spent on public health issues related to access and quality of medical, substance abuse, and behavioral health services. He has extensive experience in collaborating and interacting with health professional and community organizations, as well as expert knowledge in identifying and treating medical diseases in the field of primary care, mental health, and substance abuse. So, I'm not sure we're going to do this up here, Chris, yeah. probably so. Anton, do you want to come on up? Don't take your salad with you. <laughs> oh, okay. And we're going to have as a panelist, Mayor Bill Carpenter. And just as a reminder, Bill is a 32-year resident of Brockton. And in Easton, that would probably qualify you as a townie, but just barely. <laughs> He's the father of six children, and that's not easy on one of six. Previous to becoming mayor, Bill served four years as the Ward 5 representative to the Brockton School Committee, where he was a vocal advocate for combating substance abuse and addiction inside the school system. He's also the co-founder of Independence Academy, the state's fourth recovery, sc recovery school serving teenagers who are re-engaging their education while receiving treatment supports for substance abuse disorders. He served as the mayor of the city of Brockton for over five years at my desk. Among many important accomplishments, his administration has established a new economic development team which has crafted a long-term vision for Brockton's future. Mayor Carpenter has substantially increased investment in public safety and crime fighting strategies, created new sources of revenue, updated the city's use of technology, and made City Hall more user-friendly. Mayor Carpenter's revitalization efforts are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for both businesses and residents throughout the city. He's also our great friend. Mr. Mayor, you want to take your seat? We also have Julianne Bright. She's the Director of Product Development at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. She's responsible for the development of product strategy, including offering emerging solutions, product bundling, and product marketing activities. Julianne also leads the creation of product concepts through product testing and implementation. She's been with Blue Cross Blue Shield for 20 years in various leadership roles, including sales, member service strategy, and corporate strategy, leading corporate initiatives, key corporate initiatives. She's earned a health insurance executive certification through America's Health Insurance Plans. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in business from Bryant University and an MBA from Northeastern University. Come on up, Julianne. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm still on, let's say, Washington, D.C. time. Um, I am Dr. Anton Bazell. I am a U.S. Chamber of Commerce Fellow, but I'm also the Chief Executive Officer of the Bazell Group, which is a fast-growing management consulting firm and an aiding firm uh, located within the Washington, D.C. area. We have offices in Rockville, Maryland, as well as Atlanta, Georgia. So today I'm here to really share with you some of the um, ideas that we have from uh, the standpoint of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation uh, because we've developed an awesome kit um, that is called Sharing Solutions. So you're going to hear a little bit more about uh, Sharing Solutions. But this is what we know. Every year, somewhere around 2 million workers are find themselves out of the workplace because of an opioid use disorder. And really, when we look at that, it's impacting every business in every way. So this is what we're seeing. We're seeing higher healthcare costs, uh, higher attrition, but we're also seeing that it's impacted um, the absenteeism as well, which is rising. So as a uh, business owner and a former medical officer for SAMHSA, as well as NIAAA, I found those stats to be very alarming. So 
what we did, um, somewhere around 2017, uh, the president declared an open, um, uh, pretty much declared the opioid epidemic a national public health um, emergency. So at that time, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation pretty much decided what could they do to really address the problem from the employer lens. Uh, with that said, they were then able to reach out to, just like you all, their 1,500 state and local Chamber of Commerces, and they pulled everybody together, did an assessment, but what they found was that there, was, there were a lot of resources out there, but it just wasn't enough that we saw on the state level, the federal level, as well as in some of the nonprofits. And so the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, what they did, they curated most of that information and put it into one place, and that's what we call pretty much uh, Sharing Solutions, and that's how it was birthed. So what is Sharing Solutions? It is uh, pretty much um, the foundation um, did this to provide employer resources and to showcase innovative solutions uh, to the opioid crisis. And it's not just a one-way street that we find a lot of resources, but it was intended to be interactive and also engaging. Um, on this website, and you can find that at um, sharingsolutions.us, again, that's sharingsolutions.us. Um, on the website, you can share your experiences, you can find the resources, not just for employees, but also from employers. And so for employers, what you will find, you'll find information on a drug-free workplace. I see this and I hear this when I travel across the country all the time. You also find a lot of education and training, uh, but you'll also find out how do you partner with some of your benefits uh, uh, companies as well because of the higher cost, or what about the employee assistance program? But there was one thing that we found. Um, we had a, I had a chance to facilitate a panel in Abington, Virginia, where we kicked off the uh, 10 City Tour. Uh, there was a company, well, actually, Lidos was a big company, I'll just say that, like, so everyone's familiar with Lidos. Um, there was a guy who was an employee and he lost his son to an opioid overdose. So what he did, he actually reached out to, um, a lot of people during that time reached out to him and what he found out was that he was not alone. So he reached out to the CEO of Lidos and what the Lidos uh, CEO did was, he then took this on himself and began to do what's called a CEO pledge. And now we have many other country, companies that are actually um, signing on from a CEO standpoint, because what we understand is that this comes really from the top. It starts at the top. Also, what we also see, uh, you also find on the Share Solutions is um, uh, what we call the Business Combat the Crisis Library. There are four pillars that you will find in there. Supporting employees, uh, changing your business practice, applying for competencies, as well as how to engage communities. So for the employees, well, I told you what was in there for the employees, but what's in it for the employers? A lot of prevention, treatment, as well as recovery information. You'll find out where to find an opioid treatment program, a behavior health facility, find treatment.samhsa.gov, but you'll also find uh, many other stories or even like a 12-step program. So, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll get on to the panel, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, they wanted to really uh, find those, to really engage the businesses as well as communities in the fight against opioids. And so, we're continuing our 10-city tour. This is just the second stop of many, so I have a lot of places to go between now and September. Um, so, but we will continue talking with local stakeholders um, and really finding out what it is about sharing solutions, and we really want sharing solutions to really drive or to be that driver of change across the nation. Because what we do know is that it's really impacting our small as well as our medium-sized businesses, and they are really feeling the brunt of this. So. I will not be um, to I will not belabor this, but what I am uh, today, we are joined by two individuals, and you definitely know one of them, um, and hopefully you know the second as well. So we have uh, Mayor Bill, um, Bill Carpenter, the Mayor of Brockton, Massachusetts, um, and also Julianne Bride. She's the Senior Director of Health Engagement at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Massachusetts. So what I'm going to do right now is really uh, begin to facilitate this discussion. And if we have time, we'll open up for questions, but let me tell you, I'm speaking fast because we only have 20 minutes. So, we're gonna try to get in, um, in as much as possible. Norma Vincent Peel once said that um, every problem has it in the seeds of its own solutions. And so we're seeing that this opioid epidemic um, has really impacted every aspect of American lives, values, and ingenuity. So when we're looking at this, the small and medium-sized businesses are feeling the brunt of this. So I'm going to ask our panelists, what issues are you seeing or experiencing or being experienced by employees as a result of the opioid drug use? So uh, 
first, I want to thank the Chamber for taking the lead on this issue. I think as we look at the overall response over the past few years to the opioid epidemic, uh, this is an area where not enough has been done, where companies and employers need to take a more proactive role. And as Anton pointed out, not just a compassion for the people who work for you, but it's a good business decision. Uh, you probably don't realize how much productivity you're losing from your employees right now who are struggling with some type of substance use disorder. Then the loss of productivity expands much wider than that because most of those employees have families. And so they don't necessarily have to be the person that's been hit by this crisis. But if they have any member of their family that's suffering with addiction, with a substance use disorder, it is taking a toll on your employee. There's a huge amount of collateral damage throughout the family. And I'll guarantee you that that employee is missing time from work, is taking time out during the work day, is showing up not ready to work because of the strain and the pressure and the stress they're under dealing with their loved one uh, that's, that's in trouble right now. So it's a good business decision. So for no other reason, employers should be taking advantage of these resources and with the Chamber's lead, and Drew will talk about Blue Cross Blue Shield, who's really taking the lead here in Massachusetts by providing these resources to their employers. So as we looked at this a couple of years ago as a city, and we've done a lot of different things to take on the opioid crisis, but at one point we came to the realization that besides being local government and all the things that that involves, we're also one of the largest employers in the city. We employ a couple thousand people who all have families. And we realized that we also had a responsibility as an employer to be a leader in a leading by example. So a couple of years ago, we were one of the first companies that expanded our health benefits, our Blue Cross Blue Shield benefits, to include the cost of uh, medically assisted treatment which was not typically covered in the past, is not cheap, um, but is a lifesaver. And to make that available, not just to our employees, but to all the family members of our employees. And we know that's making a difference. So most companies have employee assistance plans. That's a start, that's a first step, but the company has to take a more proactive role now. We did it by adding medically assisted treatment. Uh, some thought that being in government, over 99% of our employees were unions and, and thought that would be an obstacle. Well, it hasn't. Uh, we were able to collectively bargain with both our police department and fire department unions a drug testing policy. Now, you may not realize how rare that is. There's only a handful of communities in the Commonwealth that have that. And we bargained it not in arbitration, not in a court decision, but we actually sat down with the unions and came up with a policy that made sense for us as an employer, it made sense for the safety of our workers on the job, but it also made sense that the unions know that they need to bring resources and help uh, to their members when they're struggling. And the way we did it is by building a policy that's built upon uh, compassion and helping employees to get them out of the workplace temporarily if necessary, but to get them healthy and get them back to work because their families need them holding down that job and bringing home that paycheck. And by being able to craft a policy like that, we were able to get it adopted with our public safety unions. So there are a lot of different avenues, I think, that employers can take to proactively be out there supporting and helping the people who work for you because it's a good business decision. Hey, Julian, can you uh, share a little bit of, from a health insurance perspective? Um, because you all actually did a lot of data collection um, here in the state of Massachusetts. And so um, I saw some great data that you all had and it impacted you and almost gave you a charge to really change uh, the trajectory of the opioid drug use in this area. So can you share some of those solutions? I think the first work Blue Cross provided leadership around was um, kind of pain management and prescribing women. So that was an effort working with a provider organization to make sure that there wasn't a continuance of over-prescribing. And our clinical team really refers to that as 
um, opioid crisis one go. And there certainly were successes there in um, limiting overprescribing of uh, prescription drugs. Since then, the ask of us has really been three things, um, to make a carpenter's point. One, there's a general, how do I explain opioid crisis? I know something's going on in my business. How do I overcome the stigma and create awareness around this issue? EAPs provide some resource, but we have had our customers come to us from a pure clinical perspective as well. They may also see, if they're self-insured, a customer may see an increase of in claims utilization for certain services, um, so they're looking for help. They're looking for help on the second piece around um, designing benefits. Um, what can we do to accommodate or incentivize people to go get treatment? So it means re removing cost share. So if you're going for methadone treatment every day and you have a deductible of $2,000, that may or may not keep you on track for your treatment plan, right? That, those costs accumulate quickly. So if we work to remove the cost barrier with employers and make it easier from a plan design perspective for people to get treatment. We're also developing programs. Um, we just um, initiated a program with a company called Hinge where you can do physical therapy at home. So how does that help someone? It helps a lot of people that have physical jobs and won't get paid if they leave their job for the day. And instead, a lot of people are taking pain management meds or potentially street drugs to feel better and get their, their job. If we give them an option to physical therapy at home and do it digitally, um, not face-to-face, -face, it improves kind of the prevention opportunity. It gives people an outlet other than taking pain management. Um, and the third area where we've uh, been asked for help is where employers are actually seeing overdoses in their workplace. And I would generalize that to any organization that has a warm public bathroom where anyone can come in. So it may or may not be your own workforce. It may be other people in your community or passersby. Um, and the issue of overdoses happening in parked cars, in libraries, um, in restaurants, gas stations is real. And we do see the owners of those businesses or management saying, can you help us? Um, what do we do here? Yeah, um, you know, as I travel across the nation, you hear those heartbreaking stories of individuals who have a fear of really being ostracized or being fired from a job. From your perspective, what are you seeing as best practices in the workplace and how do you actually change the culture and how do you like decrease that, that stigma? So I can talk about our experience. I'd say the first thing to be back on your CEO commitment is you really need leadership buy-in to make any headroom in the dresses. Um, we've worked on a pilot. Uh, the city of Brockton was one of five customers where we provided these Narcan toolkits. I can talk more about that later. But more so, we brought in a robust training program that included an overview of the crisis and then also how to respond, respond to an overdose and administer Narcan. Um, the conversations that happened in those trainings were amazing. And the information shared amongst colleagues in a variety of roles, leadership, staff positions, et cetera. And that really got at our broader objective about um, creating awareness and helping reduce the stigma. Um, we've had a variety of other internal um, conversations through our employee resource groups, part of our diversity and inclusion initiatives, where um, these teams that are self-organized come together to discuss a variety of topics. And substance use conditions has come up in three of seven groups. Um, so what I would say is let those conversations happen. Um, start somewhere and encourage. There's also an option to bring in, I've heard of employers using their EAP to bring in kind of management training programs. Um, and I would take advantage of any of those opportunities from kind of the health benefits perspective. So if I could just piggyback on Juliet's comment with the training with the toolkits. So what this program involved was employees were allowed to voluntarily sign up for training to know how to respond to an overdose and use the toolkit, give a dose of Narcan, uh, and also there's information for referral services, et cetera, in there. One of the things that surprised me as we conducted these trainings was <coughs> how little 
many of our employees really knew about this issue, about the impact of it, what signs to look for, and were really, I think they were there as much to learn about the, the, the subject at large as just to learn how to, uh, to respond to an overdose. So I think a real benefit of this has been helping us to create awareness, to educate and inform the people that work for us uh, in terms of what the reality is and what's, what's happening with this uh, epidemic right now, this public health crisis. So in Massachusetts, we're seeing by thousands of individuals who are losing their lives to um, an opioid use disorder every year. Um, and also, I know that the construction industry is pretty large. In fact, we're seeing about uh, one-fifth of the deaths occurring in the construction industry when we're combining it with opioids. Now, from your standpoint, what are some of the other ways that we can really um, see? Um, do you have any concerns for impaired workers in the workplace? Um, and I'm hearing this in the construction industry, um, even um, anything that we're seeing, even like cranes, as well as many other types of things. What are you seeing here? Because the numbers are alarming. So, and that does impact an employer like us. So that's very, very true. So depending what type of business you're in, um, again, looking at it as a business decision, think about your work as comp costs. Uh, that's a very large business expense uh, for most businesses. Well, if you're in a construction field, uh, anything like that. In our case, uh, we have a Department of Public Works. It's one of our largest departments. People operating large trucks, heavy machinery uh, throughout the course of the day. Not to mention our police and fire safety personnel. Um, one person on that job site who's under the influence jeopardizes the health and safety of everyone else on that job site. They're not making good decisions, they don't have their full faculties, they're distracted, all these different reasons, but you're going to incur a higher number of job site accidents because of this crisis now. So this absolutely is an area where um, we have the highest exposure, I think, for direct impact in the job place. So um, in, I'll give you the story. In Richmond, Indiana, there's a company called Belden. So Belden found, found themselves in a situation where they had plenty of jobs, but there not enough folks who could fill those positions who were drug free. And so are you seeing the same thing here? Because what they did there was they linked up with those providers in um, the city or in the county, and they created programs whereby the individuals could then um, go into um, a new position, a non safety sensitive position, and after going through drug rehab, they would get a higher or better position. Are you seeing programs such as that now um, as well? And can you give us more information? Sure, I, I can speak um, from the sessions I've attended um, for the general contractors and subcontractors and other um, labor forms that there seems to be um, in those organizations a tolerance and a willingness to help people, um, to put them in roles where they won't jeopardize the safety of a project or their colleagues, but to provide the resources. So uh, they're doing that in a variety of ways, some mentorship programs. A lot of our uh, labor customers actually are hiring their own recovery coaches and people that will work with the workforce almost daily um, to reinforce kind of their recovery to treatment options. Um, and then some apprenticeships as well. So that's how I've heard about it manifesting. Yeah, I think it really comes down to changing the culture. It's, it's, the way we've thought about things over the years is, well, that would be a fireable offense, and if anybody got caught under the influence of drugs at work, they're going to get fired. Well, the culture has to change to the point where not only that employee may feel that they're able to reach out for help, but I think even more effectively that employees' co-workers, because there's almost always someone else on the job who knows about the person who's struggling, but they may, they're reluctant to maybe try to get them help or try to bring it forward because they don't want them to lose their job because they know their family. They don't want to put that family out of work uh, even though they know there's an issue. But if they understand that the philosophy and the culture of the company has changed where we start off by helping first and only end up with a termination at some point way down the road after a, a couple failed attempts at recovery, I think that will facilitate getting people into the uh, into the help that they need. So this, that brings us to a good point. So if someone is in the workplace, whether they're working for the city of Brockton or working for Blue Cross Blue Shield or any of your employers, um, 
to what extent does that organization need to provide some kind of accommodation if the person is taking an opioid and is working? You got me on that one. If they're taking an opioid and we're going to accommodate them, yeah. as far as do you accommodate them within the workplace? Because they're currently. They, for instance, uh, you know, I may look like I'm 25, yeah. but I know I have pains. Um, eventually, I'm going to need some pain meds. And so, if I'm on pain meds and um, dealing with that from another, let's say, disease entity, and I have to go to work, do our employers accommodate <laughs> the individuals who are um, dealing with that? I don't know that we've actually been faced with, with that specific situation. I think in, in our jobs, we're most impacted. Um, we do have to work around. It gets a little complicated in Massachusetts. And I think employees are all trying to figure out how they're going to deal with marijuana now when it comes to drug testing and, and discipline. And we're, we're revisiting that as an employer um, ourselves uh, because when we negotiated that drug policy with our public safety people, we agreed to leave marijuana off the list of drugs we were testing for because we needed to do that to get the deal. Because there's an argument on the other side as to if there's no evidence that the person's using at work, and that test shows use in the last 30 days, then how in the world do you have the right to just discipline someone based upon that alone? So we do have reasonable suspicion, though. If there's reasonable suspicion on the workplace, we can demand a test on the spot based upon a reasonable suspicion. And if we get a positive test, then that entitles us to random testing going forward. So you've got to try to figure out what those thresholds are that will work for both sides. I'll just add, I think the uh, accommodations that I have seen have been around helping someone as they're going through treatment and encouraging that person to stick with the treatment. So whether it's an outpatient, I'm sorry, inpatient facility, you know, for 30 days or and they're out of the job, how do you help bring them back into the workforce and not feel ostracized or feel like everyone knows I just spent 30 days on a substance use facility? Or people going for, for daily treatment, how do you flex their schedule? and make it so that they can go for psychotherapy, bring back, or, or whatever they might need. And we do make those accommodations. Right. So mm -hmm. in our policy, first offense, no publicity, no discipline, so long as the person agrees to treat them. Okay, so I'm getting a nod. So while more strategies are uh, definitely in place for preventing and treating um, opioid use disorders in the workplace, organizations continue to really have uh, many unknowns as far as your final statement, where do we go from here? Well, I think, it, I think the, where we go is where we started, that, that employers now have to look at this as a necessary part of doing business. It becomes part of their HR function in terms of how we're going to address this and take this on proactively and keep our workforce uh, productive and keep them safe and healthy at the same time. It's going to probably require us changing the way we think about this issue. I would just um, say that make it someone's job in your organization to address this. So in the five pilot customers we worked with, Mayor Carpenter championed it for the city of Brockton. At Shawnee Construction, it was a VP of safety. Um, at the New England Carpenters Benefit Fund, it was a benefit claims manager. At Blue Cross, you know, for our employee population, it was through HR. And then for the town of Ware, it was through a project coordinator and the mayor for where. So I share that because it really can be anyone's responsibility in your organization. But I would encourage you to find a home and start somewhere with providing resources to your organization to, the, to get out of awareness and address the stigma. And thank you. And so while I'll end on, on um, this panel with this quote, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I like to say American tenacity has never been defeated. And so Americans are constantly um, they consistently find seeds of solutions in every crisis that we face. And really the opioid uh, crisis is no different from all the other crises. And so when we band together with the resources and with the compassion, there's nothing that can defeat us. And so we can accomplish everything when those things are done. So again, I would just like to thank my panelists today. Uh, I want to thank Julianne Bride as well as Mayor Carpenter. So come on, let's put our hands together for them. So thank you all for your time.
eight more of these sessions to do, but I think that the benchmark should always be Metro South and City of Rockton. I think you will find that this community has come together like no other to combat the issue in the spirit that you just ended with. Thank you so much. I also want to, wasn't that a great lunch? Thank you, Pepper Points Catering, for the
and we were fired because we wouldn't fire our employees. So as you can imagine, the strike was um, pretty, pretty well hit home to me and my family. And I was very pleased that after I stood up there with Vice President Joe Biden, um, a-hole delays learned their lesson and settled the contract. And this wasn't about the union asking for more. It was the union standing up and saying, we're not willing to take less. It was about give backs for a company that actually received um, tax breaks and used the tax breaks not to hire more people, but to do a stock buyback. Now that's an interesting way for me to start off a chamber speech. <laughs> but what I want to say, and having met with small business owners this morning, is you can do business and be successful and do good at the same time. And that was the stop and shop story. That's the story of each and every one of you in this room. And that is what makes Massachusetts vital. You saw that the governor had to go after National Grid. This is about economic security in Massachusetts. It's about economic stability in Massachusetts. And each and every one of you, small business or large, contributes to the economic vitality of this state. And I thank each and every one of you for doing so. So um, I also want to thank the chamber. And I want to thank Harbor One, who just left a fantastic round table with me. And I obviously want to thank the mayor and all the elected officials here for the incredible work that you're doing in the city of Brockton. Um, we chose Brockton and this area to kick off a new initiative. Some of you may be familiar with what was the small business banking partnership that was started <laughs> under my predecessor, Steve Grossman. But we were trying to envision a way to take that and bring it to the next level. So as a business person, I always tend to do pilots. And so this morning, we announced and we kicked off the Small Business Initiative Pilot Program. And what we are doing is we will be doing roundtables across the state, but we are working with folks just like Harvard One and the local chamber, but bringing in <coughs> small business owners, women, people from diverse backgrounds, immigrants, and doing our research in order to create a downloadable toolkit or a hand-delivered toolkit, because one of the things we talked about today was the internet, or not knowing how to use the internet, or social media, or not knowing how to do branding, or how do you deal with all of the regulatory issues, or the legal issues, or just how do you do it? And we will be pulling all that information together so that we can work with trusted resources and trusted partners and use the leverage of the state treasurer's office to get that all across the state. But where did we kick it off? Brockton. And I want to give a big shout out to all of you because it was an amazing morning and we will end up ultimately with our awards today. So what a way to book and end the event. So I'm very excited about that. So the
And so everybody, whenever I go on a television show, talk show, or a radio show, particularly Dan Ray, for example, everybody wants to talk about the lottery. And of course, the lottery has been headquartered in the southern part of the state for so very long that it's actually had a positive impact in this area, although we must all agree and know that the lottery is the only source of unrestricted local aid for all 351 local communities. As a former elected official, I, a local elected official, I can tell you I rely tremendously on what that could do on an annual basis. So one year it might be snow and ice, another year it might be a crossing guard, another year a roving nurse, but it is unrestricted, which means the local communities get to make a determination themselves on how they need to use those resources annually. So my goal as a business person, because honestly, coming from Stop and Shop, the lottery was the most like anything I had done before, except of course, in my local role, or in my finance role, or in my legal roles, but it was the most familiar, because I'd been in the store since I was three years old. I was very fortunate. My mom was president and chief operating officer, and one of the top 10 businesswomen in America in the 70s, so literally, I was in the stores from the time I was born. <laughs> but as a business person, I looked at the lottery, I knew how important it was, and I had a personal goal. They had never hit a billion dollars in profit ever in the history of the lottery. So we did it. And we did it two years ago, and I'm excited to let you know, and of course I don't want to give it a curse, because the fiscal year is not over until June, the end of June. We will be breaking that record this year. So that's money back to every single one of you that lives in the community, sorry you don't, <laughs> you can go here if you like to. <laughs> and the mayor can find you a great home. Isn't that right, Mr. Mayor? But what I'm saying is we've done it, and we've done it in a range of ways. Rationalized business operations. I actually have spoken to how do you do more with less, uh, but of course you can, it means you can also do less with less, so you have to balance that. And part of it was modernizing operations, you, the use of technology, greater marketing strategies. Um, because really, once upon a time, the lottery just, it sold itself. There was no competition. But now we have casinos, we have Plain Ridge slot parlors, we have daily fantasy sports, and pending sports <coughs> betting. And so consequently, the lottery with, now how do you like this everybody? Five, over five billion in sales, one billion plus um, profit, and um, Senator Brady, the um, legislature only gives me four and a half million for marketing and advertising, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> now what business person here would ever be watching incoming competition and limit your ad budget. <laughs> Hi, Senator Brady. <laughs> well, as you know, I know you wanted to file a bill. He wanted to file a bill, actually, so we won't get that one. I'm a big supporter getting the advertising money back into the treasury. That's right. It was cut under a former administration. <laughs> now, what I do want to say to you is think of the achievements we've made doing all the things that we're doing. And so what we're asking now from the legislature, as they look at all of the competition coming in, if they all go online, you better put us online, or I'm gonna be coming back to see you next year saying, I am well managing the sad decline of the Massachusetts State Lottery. So in other words, make sure that your folks all know how important the lottery is. And I'm gonna tell you something, as a former retailer, this is not at the expense of the mom and pop operations. This is not at the expense of the local um, convenience store operator or the gas station marts. Because what we have seen nationally is in the communities that have adopted online lottery 
and I'm not referring to sports betting, daily fantasy sports, or any of those. Sales have grown for the retailer while they have grown for the lottery. Well, how is that possible? Because it's a new customer. And this is how you reach your new customers today. There isn't anyone in this room who's a retailer or a small business owner that doesn't think about cashless and think about online. Because the reality is, is that's where the younger customers are. And even my dad, who's going to be 90 in January, is starting to do things online, which is pretty scary because I don't know what he's charging. <laughs> but in terms of the lottery, we will not recommend credit cards because for I, for one, have personal concerns about compulsive gambling, but what we know is that there are greater controls for compulsive gambling online than there are in the reality of bricks and mortar. Think about somebody who lives in Brockton. They go and they buy the newspaper in the morning and their lottery ticket, but they're commuting to Boston. So on the way up, they realize they need gas, pull off the road, pull in, it's a quick mart off with it, buy a lottery ticket. Then they go into Boston at lunchtime, go out and buy another lottery ticket, and then get a phone call from home, would you please pick something up at the supermarket on your way home, lottery ticket. Nobody knows where that person has stopped and the kind of lottery ticket that they might be picking up. But online, you can. You can set limits. You can also um, track because it's an IP address. And what the Convulsive Gambler Associations, who are trying to help people with those issues, have found is that there is less compulsive gambling online. And in particular, we would not be using credit. It would be debit. Um, or gift cards, which you have to buy at a retailer, I might add, and um, it's actually not as dangerous, which was shocking to me and really had an impact on me. I was against online lottery when I first got it, <coughs> So I wanted to talk about that because um, I think it really impacts everybody's life, and it is a business. But I also want to share with you how we're doing economically in Massachusetts. The governor and I came back from a field trip. I like to um, organize these for us to meet with the rating agencies in New York. Um, Massachusetts, compared to many places in the country, is doing well. We really sincerely are. Yet, with all that, we have our challenges at times. Those who follow revenue numbers, and I do obviously on a monthly basis, actually every two weeks I check on it. But Massachusetts revenue numbers have been bumpy. They're not always consistent. And even with our bustling economy, and you see cranes everywhere, real estate prices are off the roof. Commercial real estate is, is incredibly successful right now. But we still have our gaps. And part of it is also, and we talked about it this morning at the at our round table, but it's also the fact that people are in so much debt. And that when, for example, gas prices came down a couple of years ago, you did not see increased spending, which is typically what you see. What you saw is people putting the extra resources towards their debt. So some of the things that we've been doing in the treasurer's office uh, are related to that. And um, what it is is that we have created programs, first of all, to deal and teach and help people acquire the financial skills they need to succeed from very small children all the way through seniors. We had done a financial literacy task force where we got 22 recommendations and then enacted them. Yes, it really is state government. We really did not just put it on a shelf because it's important that people understand the financial decisions that they make. And our goal is to keep people out of debt. But our second goal, and this is a, what another exciting announcement I have to make today, 
is that having done a job study at Massacre Building Authority, also under the Treasurer's Office, we saw that the jobs that are here in Massachusetts that, that pay really good wages require some form of post-secondary education, either college or vocational and technical training. So a pilot we did in five cities and one suburban community, and we learned how to get this up and running, and in January 2020, every baby born or adopted in Massachusetts will receive from us, through our Baby Steps College Savings Plan, a seeded college savings account with financial literacy services wrapped around the child and their family. January 2020, from the Massachusetts State Treasurer's Office. <laughs> At no cost to the taxpayer. Another round of applause. <laughs> and what we statistically, it has shown us, is there is an enormously greater chance for kids to achieve that education vocational or technical training, fill the jobs that businesses need them to be educated for, because our job study knows exactly what those skill sets are, and this is the beautiful part of this, assume significantly less debt. Families and kids that save only up to $500 are less likely to fund the education on debt because they get what it means to them, to the kid, and to each of their futures. So we're really excited about this program. I could talk to you about all the other 10 areas of the treasurer's office, but I bet all of you would like to see the award winners, and you'd also like to get back to work and make more money. <laughs> so, I will turn it back to our MC. Thank you for having me. Madam Treasurer, thank you so much for yeah, those you. comments. Thank you. thank you very much for uh, the entrepreneurial spirit that you have in the Treasurer's Office. And yes, we do have a gift for you. We know it can't exceed $50 or else it'll be on the surplus property list. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for, for being with us.
The Metro South Chamber and Bank of America Small Business Services are pleased to present the 2019 Entrepreneur of the Year Award to Launch. Come on up, Launch. She also observed a lack of know-how with many businesses on how to have an impact on social media. With other business owners, she observed many were unaware of how cost-effective social media advertising is in comparison to other forms of advertising. So seeing an opportunity, she decided to open a business whose mission is to provide affordable, high-quality social media services to local businesses. Since launch started in 2016, the business has significantly grown both in revenue and numbers of employees. One full-time employee was added in 2018 with two part-time positions added in 2019. The launch effect is launching a unique approach to developing their services. According to Diana, they apply their blog writing skills and techniques to social media post-copywriting. This has resulted in a minimum of 100% growth in clicks, impressions, and engagements for their clients' social media results. They also offer Facebook or Instagram advertising as part of their basic packages. This is unique to launch because offering this service as part of a basic package is very uncommon and is a differentiator benefiting local business customers. Her long-term goal for launch is to provide heavily discounted or free services for nonprofits. And as a member of the Brockton Area Young Professionals and a speaker at local business organizations and workshops, Diana already has had a head start in connecting with our local community. Launch's mission to give back to the community begins in its own office. Launch is committed to employing and providing flexible, high-paying jobs for mothers, in which they can fulfill their work on their own schedules, working from home while earning competitive work as freelancers, creating blogging or social media content, <clears throat> and others. So the Metro South Chamber, Bank of America, are proud to announce Launch of Canton as the 2019 Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And unfortunately, as you already know, Diana couldn't be with us today. So accepting the award on her behalf is George Durante from Mass Development. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, as, as you heard, Diana can't be here today. Uh, she's in Portugal, which means she's doing something right, correct? <laughs> but she did send me a note uh, that she wanted, and, and a few words that she wanted, wanted to convey to you today. Uh, she says, thank you for the nomination and for the award. Uh, thank you for the Chamber for the recognition of this. She says that she humbly accepts it on behalf of, of her superhero team of writers who have helped launch grow at such a fast pace. They're her rock. Being an entrepreneur and working on social media is hashtag trending right now, and it can be just as challenging as it is rewarding. Launch has achieved the success we've had because of our team and also all of our amazing clients who have grown with us over the years too. And I'll say that personally, I've had the pleasure of working with her through the Red Rock Young Professionals, and she's been there since the early stages. Fantastic company. And she, she closes with thank you to the community and the chamber for all your support and recognition. Thank you. George, and I can tell you because we have 11,000 students at Bridgewater State, if you don't connect with your customers through social media, you are not connecting with the generation that's coming up. It's so important. Our next presentation is the Small Business of the Year Award, which recognizes business leadership, which has fostered company growth and created new jobs while contributing to the community. The 2019 Small Business of the Year Award is presented to Immerse Agency. Come on up, Immerse. Scott Salonow formed, founded Immerse Agency in 2013 with just his own laptop. With no outside investors, no loans, the agency has grown to employ five employees who built a core platform of campaigns that inspire, excite, and amaze their clients and customers. 
with revenue and profit growth more than doubling each year, two more employees are anticipated to be added, added within the next few months. Scott says that at a Mercy Agency, we are fortunate to have a team that is sharp and innovative and who collectively strive to change the marketing norms. At the forefront of the movement is our belief that you don't advertise to consumers, you touch them where they live, eat, work, and socialize. Mercy Agency specializes in the development of multi-platform, multimedia marketing campaigns, including media planning and placement, TV, radio, digital, social, and print, public relations, graphics, web development, and more. The agency's expertise is in the marketing of traveling entertainment clients, and thus they've toured with some of the most valuable treasures on earth. I was thinking of the mayor in that context. <laughs> Other examples include the oldest known image of Jesus, the only authenticated pirate treasure ever discovered, relics preserved from Cleopatra's royal palace, and more. And as a result of their marketing campaigns, the results are truly astounding. With more than 15 million events sold at venues throughout the United States for those activities. Boston Business Journal recently named Mercy Agency Scott, CEO Scott Sullivan, was one of its 40 under 40 business leaders in the greater Boston community. At the forefront of the agency's values is a social and community betterment, it provides time and resources to local programs such as the Canton Food Bank, Pan Mass Challenge, and the Red Sox Foundation, and so many others. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating our 2019 Small Business of the Year recipient, Scott Salomon of our Merce Agency.